So you might have heard that Coleman Hughes um, had a bit of a hard time this week on The View when he went on to promote his new book. Uh, now he went on with Joe Rogan, and uh, Rogan was pretty funny. He called The View a rabies-infested hen house. You must be taking lessons from Keaton. That's a Keaton line if I ever if I ever heard one. Uh, <laughs> yeah. so- <laughs> <laughs> I'm a rat, man. <laughs> this is this is the man who described Debbie Wasserman Schultz as a raisin faced Medusa. This is probably his yes. all time classic. Um, all right, so I intercut these. Um, I intercut the Rogan interview with the relevant clips from the View. Um, so uh, we'll we'll talk a little bit about the thesis of his of his book as we go as it as it arises. So let's take a look. I didn't know who Sonny Hostin was. I actually still really don't know. So I wasn't expecting necessarily for her to kind of try to ambush me in that way and and uh, attack my character in that way. And I responded to it in the moment as I do. And I didn't expect it to go as viral as it did. It is the show that people love to hate. <laughs> yes, that's true. that's true. They they get so much hate watching and yep. hate hate watching viral clips of them saying ridiculous things. I mean, yeah. it is it is a uh, a rabies infested hen house. <laughs> and, and, not my ahead. question, but when you say that uh, socioeconomics picks out people in a better way than mm-hmm. race, mm-hmm. when you do look at the socioeconomics, you see the huge disparity between white households and black households. You see the huge disparity between white households and Hispanic households. So your argument, and I've read your book twice because I wanted to give it a chance. Mm. I think I think she came into it with an agenda. Of course, you know they do everything with an agenda. Yeah, you know um, she she came into it. It seems want uh, uh, really wanting to paint me as someone that has been co opted by the right wing. Yeah, and I don't know how much research she had done into me. She claimed to have read my book twice, which is almost certainly not true. Yeah, I, I because that she was totally missummarizing. When did the book come books. out? February. The odds are very low. Very low, right? Because yeah, very low. Think of how many guests they have on their show. How, how many much time she do, has? Family obligations. Yeah, yeah, two yeah. Bu- What is it about? Two fifty pages. Uh, something? something like that. Yeah. I don't think so. Yeah. Your argument for color blindness, I think, is something that the right has co opted, and so many in the black community, if I'm being honest with you, because I want to be, believe that you are being used as a pawn by the right. And that you're a charlatan of sorts. He's, he's not a Republican. Well, so how do you? Who, who, he's who never voted well, for you, 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 you said that you're a conservative. No, you, you, no, no. No, you did. You actually said that uh, <laughs> in the podcast that you did two weeks ago. I said I was a conservative. He's not. Yes, he's not. yes you did. It's, so, but my question to you, my question to you is, how do you respond okay. to those critics? Okay, let's let give him a okay, let so, him answer. So, yes, first thing I want to, I think it's very important. The quote that you just pointed out about doing something special for the Negro. That's from the book, Why We Can't Wait, that that I just mentioned. Yes. A couple paragraphs later, he lays out exactly what that something special was, and it was the Bill of Rights for the Disadvantaged, a broad class-based policy. But he also says you must include race. (laughs) No, he didn't. He says it's a- Yes, he does. Okay, well, everyone can go, everyone should go read the book, Why We Can't Wait. Let's not get sidetracked by that. Yeah. Um, I don't think I've been co-opted by anyone. I've only voted twice, both for Democrats, Mm -hmm. although I'm an independent. I would vote for a Republican, Mm -hmm. probably a non-Trump Republican, if they were compelling. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think there's any evidence I've been co-opted by anyone, and I think that that's that's an ad hominem tactic people use to not address really the important conversations we're having here. And I I think it's better, and it would be better for everyone if we stuck to the topics rather than make it about me. With no no evidence, but I I just I want to give you the opportunity to respond to the. I I appreciate it. all right, so yeah, so that so that whole segment, whatever whatever you think of Coleman Hughes's theory, which is essentially, it was the Bernie Sanders premise that you know I didn't include everything in the segment, but he's basically saying because black and Hispanic people are disproportionately impoverished, um, if you do more class based programs, they will disproportionately benefit. Now, Hostin points, uh, it tries to attack him as believing that, uh, you know, uh, that we, we, we should have a colorblind society, which he says, you know, that's impossible. Of course, you're going to 
recognize race. It's a question of rec- uh, dealing with people first as human beings. Now, this was, as he pointed out in an interview he did with Matt Taibbi, um, this was left-wing race relations 101 until people like Ibram X. Kendi and Robin D'Angelo uh, got, I would argue, elevated by the media, got elevated by corporations and put forward an extremely divisive ideology that I, I don't believe, and I think the numbers demonstrate, don't help but hurt a great deal. Now, that aside, whether you agree with that or don't agree with it, the way that he was treated by them on The View was absolutely unconscionable. And as I will demonstrate, um, in terms of what she says about what uh, MLK's book says or doesn't say, which I, I must say, yes, you can invoke the thoughts of somebody that you admire, but it's certainly not decisive either way. Either way. Now, I suspect because Hostin is so dishonest, what Hughes contends, and from what I know about the end of King's career, um, is probably true. He probably advocated a class-based program similar to what he's advocating. Oh, no, even- that's absolutely true. I mean, that that's, as a matter of fact, true. I mean, it was unbelievable that she said um, – I forget exactly what she said, but she said something to the effect of, well, King wrote about class earlier in his life, but had mostly backgrounded it later in his life, which is absolutely not true. I mean, that is just uh, that is just a bald face, a lie, or she's just incredibly ignorant. His last project was the Poor People's Campaign. His last project was the Poor People's March. He talked, he foregrounded economics in his last days. Some might say that's why he met the fate, the fate that he met. Exactly. Uh, some might say that. Um, well, but yeah, well, so well, she, she acted like he he had somehow abandoned any sort of like class rhetoric. That's just uh, absolutely untrue. Well, it's just the whole the whole display is disgusting. The name dropping of King's daughter that way. Um, just uh, even, you know, Taibbi pointed this out in his article. Oh, she mentioned a, his daughter to make herself sound like an expert when exactly. what she was saying was completely wrong. It right. is just a factually, historically 101 wrong that Martin Luther King stopped talking about class as much later in his life. The last pro his last project before he was killed was the poor people's campaign was the poor people's March. That was the last thing that he was working on. Right. And what, what he's saying is true. Uh, These people, they will always want to attack the character of the person rather than the ideas they're presenting because their own ideas are on such weak ground. And they'll just lie. They'll just lie. I mean, according to people who have tried to find this, he denied that he ever described himself as a conservative. It looks like she just threw that out there, just made it up. Um, But at the end, she says something that we can demonstrably prove is just is just not true. So let's see what Rogan had to say about this. It's a dumb way of addressing a thing and to immediately say that someone's been co-opted with no evidence whatsoever. There's nothing about anything that you say that seems right wing. You know, you're mm. just objectively looking at these subjects and giving a very intelligent and measured opinion of them. That that's not and just because some people who happen to vote Republican may agree with you, yeah, like that, that's a ridiculous statement that you're co-opted. I, right. I, I think you're probably one of the least co-opted people I've ever talked to. Mm. You're very open-minded and you, yeah, you're well, very thanks. you're very objective. I you, try to be. I yeah. try to be. Um, but uh, you know, I, I would argue even if I were co-opted, co-opted hypothetically. That doesn't make my argument here right now wrong. Right. Right. Because people that are co-opted sometimes say true things. Yes. So even if I were, I would say it's still ad, uh, it's an ad hominem attack. It's to the person rather than to the argument. Yes. So let's get on to the issue. Yeah. I- okay. Now, now you want to see a dingbat at work. All right. So Joy Behar here doesn't even know what she's talking about, which she concedes. She says, we talk about anti-racism. I don't know who the people are. Maybe you know. He actually has to tell her who the people are and then goes and makes a case against his book 
based on the fact that he has an issue with anti-racism, which she concedes at the beginning of the question. She doesn't know what it is or who advocates the idea. So here you go. The question, because you write that the anti-racism movement, there are a couple of people, I don't even know who they are. Maybe Robin D'Angelo. Robin D'Angelo, yeah. Ibram Kendi, for instance. Okay. Like, like he has to help her set up the question. Right. But if you need the guest to set up the question, maybe you shouldn't be asking the fucking question. <laughs> maybe you shouldn't be on this panel. Maybe you should not be on TV. Maybe you are too much of a dingbat to be on TV talking about politics. Something you could say about most of the people on this show. Well, they, uh, you say that that is just a form of another form of racism. And you even say it has a lot in common with white supremacy. How can you compare those two things? You, I you talk about anti-racism. Because... You're comparing it to white supremacy. Because they, they both view your race as an extremely significant part of who you are. So r white supremacists, they obviously say, we all know what they say, okay? Uh, Neo-racists like Rob D'Angelo, they say that to be white is to be ignorant, for example. Well, uh -huh. this is a racial stereotype, and I want to call a spade a spade and say this is not the style of anti-racism we have to be teaching our kids. We should be teaching them that your race is not a significant feature of you, who you are. Who you are is your character, your value, and your skin color doesn't say anything about that. That's, that's actually misrepresenting so, what, what Robin D'Angelo's yeah. position it's is. It's in her book. But well, a lot, that's a lot of, so here we go. The most okay, so keep that in mind, Austin's denial that that's what Robin D'Angelo's book actually says. We'll get back to that. Um, if you see the audience applauding there, that happens repeatedly during the segment. And I think that was really pissing off Sonny Hostin because these ideas, they are not popular even in the communities that they are supposedly trying to address. When, when Hostin says in that segment, you know, um, some black people are saying, which, the rich ones that you know? Which, which, which ones are saying that he's co-opted? Who exactly? Keaton, anything? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, I, I mean, I think that's that's all right. And that's all that's all good. And in, in this context, I mean, yeah, they they came off looking like idiots because at the view, that's that's exactly what they are. Um, but he's also a, a pretty pro Israel piece of garbage. I know. Uh, as I know. Well. Yeah. Yes. So he just want to. Just want to say that. Yes. I, we'll, know, we'll I, I don't feel there. like we can let that go anymore. Like I don't feel like I feel like that sticks in my craw too much to just ignore in a segment like this. Yeah. He uh he actually, from what I understand, maybe we'll do a follow up on this. Yeah, that was a whole other thing on Rogan where yeah, but that's you know, why Rogan was putting out that it's a genocide. It. Yes, they got into it a little bit. Right. Yeah. I didn't watch the whole thing. I watched like the first minute and a half. That was enough to know enough to say that. Yep. Yep. No, you're right. The interesting part was their audience seemed to be on my side. Yes, yes. And that's their audience. Yes. Well, their audience is not really their audience. Their audience uh -huh. is a, a, a group of people they bring in uh -huh. to watch television shows. Uh -huh. You know, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, audiences before for TV shows, but mm. they're, a lot of them are paid. They're mm -hmm. paid to be there. Mm. So, because you know, they have to guarantee that there's going to be people there. So, there's services that you hire. And when a show gets really, really popular... Um, you know, like Letterman or something like that. Obviously, it has its own fan base. Right. And those people will try to get tickets before anybody else does. And, and in that case, they probably don't need to use a service anymore. They just get actual fans. But arguably, like, m the fans, the real fans of The View that are like, oh, these ladies are on point. Most of those people can't leave the house. Like, they're probably right. immobile. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> that's true okay yeah. so so now i've i've been i've been out here in uh hollywood enough times to know that if you walk around in the right areas they'll be handing out free tickets to the bill maher taping for instance um i didn't know they actually pay people to sit in audiences misha you've been out here forever have you ever seen this oh yeah yeah I didn't know yeah, that. I always thought it was just free. I mean, I knew they didn't charge to get in. I knew that it was free. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, yeah. A couple but of I didn't know they paid you when I was like watch. a young guy. But, uh, but yeah, I didn't know they actually paid audience members. Depending on the show. Yeah, some of them. It's very, very, very little. Okay. I, uh, yeah, I had no idea. Um, all right. Well, that, kind of, that helps to explain. Because you very often wonder who the fuck wants to be in a room with these witches. <laughs> 
That explains yeah. it. They're paid to be there. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Cleared that up. Um, all right. So uh, Matt Taibbi did a, a great article on this. If you're not a member of his Substack, I am. Do dissidences. Racket News. They do some great. Uh, he does some great stuff over there. Uh, on the view, a crack finally shows in the propaganda facade. Uh, so he did a little bit of a Q&A with him. I'm just, I'm just going to get into a little bit of it. But if you remember, Sonny Hostin said that he was misrepresenting Robin D'Angelo's work. And uh, Taibbi dug up a relevant quote. This is from White Fragility. How can I say that if you are white, your opinions on racism are most likely ignorant when I don't even know you? I can say so because nothing in mainstream U.S. culture gives us the information we need to have the nuanced understanding of arguably the most complex and enduring social dynamic of the last several hundred years. A positive white identity is an impossible goal. I strive to be less white. I mean, it sounds like <laughs> he accurately described it to me. <laughs> Striving to be less white. Okay. Um, so this is a little bit from Taibbi. His current career is only possible or necessary. In his new book, he says he finds race boring and says he didn't choose the topic. It chose me because he's confronting anti-racist writers like Kendi who have had extraordinary recent success in radically redefining both racism and the goals of the civil rights movement. Kendi has also radically redefined grifting because it looks like he stole $40 million from the institute he was supposed to be running. And I don't know. I haven't heard anything about it. it looks like he's going to get a pass on that. Nice work if you can get it. Uh, surfing on ideas that until recently were niche concepts in remote corners at a handful of elite universities, Kendi popularized the idea that all unequal outcomes are caused by racism and made respectable the incredible idea that the only remedy to racist discrimination is anti-racist discrimination. This shift from a standard of equal opportunity to equity from the Kingian all we say to America is be true to what you said on paper to Kendi's. The only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination is a huge leap and it's plain dishonesty to pretend it isn't or that one flowed naturally into the other. Exactly. That's how I think a lot of these ideas play. They try to present themselves as building on previous movements when actually in many ways they are repudiations of previous movements in these areas, whether gender or race or sexuality. Uh, you have anything, Keaton? Well, yeah. And, and I think part of why King was so much more effective than any of these sort of modern day grifters, if, if you want to call them that, I think that's fair, is precisely because he brought an economic component to it. Right. He, he organized workers. He spoke to ordinary people in ways that these people really don't. Robin D'Angelo gets paid by corporations to go and lecture workers. So she gets some exposure to them, but it's in this very sort of like clinical setting. Right. Um, Ibram X. Kendi is an academic and, uh, you know, a lot of those ideas uh, live and die in those uh, types of settings. Um, they don't really become zeitgeist in the way that King's ideas did, thankfully. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think what's really obvious is if you want to know how effective these ideas are at challenging power, look who promotes them. Big corporations. You yes, think big, big corporations, corporations are in the business of undermining their own power? Yes, it's academia and corporations. These, these are top down, whereas, you know, M M Martin Luther King... Uh, was ve like a very salt of the earth. He spoke to ordinary people. And, um, you know, that's where you're always going to find more power because there's more numbers. Exactly. And, uh, and speaking to that, uh, finally, this is just one question from the Q&A Taibbi did with him. Is this neo-racism just fashion among a narrow slice of people or something that's actually spread far and wide to which use responds... I tend to think it's only popular in the liberal elite, 
These views do not have deep subscription in the Democratic Party base even. And the easiest way to see this is by how many people have made this point with the word Latin X. At first, it's like you heard it every two seconds. It came out of the mouth of even Joe Biden, Elizabeth Warren, and so forth. And then when they finally did a poll asking Hispanic people, do you know this word? Do you like this word? You had literally 4%. But you'd actually never guess that if you were yourself an elite in the bubble. If you were just on Twitter, you'd think it was 30%, 40% of people. I think it's like that about a lot of these things. Amen. Amen. You know what my theory is, is that there's a huge crash coming. It's coming. And so I'm putting my money into precious metals, mostly gold. And so I, I have a, I have a su substantial percentage of my retirement in gold. And uh, my financial future is secure with gold and silver. That's why I, d I decided to sponsor and I partnered with Colonial Metals Group. Uh, they helped me set up a safe and secure self-directed IRA where I have access to my assets, no matter what the stock market or for, mat for that matter, whatever the government's doing, I have access to it. And I plus I got it in gold coins. OK, so let the team of experts at Colonial Metals Group help you protect your family's future. We put together a special offer. Listen to this offer. You click on the link in the description of this video or call the special 800 number and you're going to receive a safe and up to ten thousand dollars in free silver. I don't know how they could do that, but go to colonialmetalsgroup.com slash Jimmy Door Show. Colonialmetals.com slash Jimmy dash door dash show. Or you can call 888-910-1419. That's 888-910-1419. And a nice person like our friend Paul from Colonial, he'll tell you all about it. I had lunch with Paul. When he explained all this to me, I was like, hey, I'd like to work with you guys. And I'd like to put my my retirement money in an IRA account with you guys with the precious metals. So go to uh, 888-910-1419. That's Colonial Pretel, Colonial Metals, or you can go to colonialmetalsgroup.com slash jimmy dash store dash show, or click the link in the description. Hey, there's still tickets available in Stockholm, Oslo, Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, Cortland, New York, Oakmont, Pennsylvania, El Paso, Texas, San Antonio, Texas, Edmonton, Alberta, Vancouver, British Columbia, Denver, Ashland, Virginia, and Athens, Georgia. See you there.